Let's solve the first of two heat exchanger problems. Oil enters a counterflow heat exchanger at 450K with a mass flow rate of 10 kilograms per second and exits at 350K. A separate stream of liquid water enters at 20 degrees C, 5 bar. Each stream experiences no significant change in pressure. Stray heat transfer with the surroundings of the heat exchanger and kinetic and potential energy effects can be ignored. The specific heat of the oil is constant, C is two kilojoules per kilogram K. If the designer wants to ensure no water vapor is present in the exiting water stream, what is the allowed range of mass flow rates for the water in kilograms per second? Let's look at this. What they're describing here when they say counterflow heat exchanger would be taken as a shell and tube uh, counterflow heat exchanger. And this is what that looks like. Essentially, it's a pipe within a pipe. So you have a pipe inside uh, a larger pipe, which is known as a shell. And it's not really one pipe. It's a whole bunch of tubes flowing inside the shell. So the oil comes in. And, and flows through many tubes and comes out the other side. Water flows into the shell and flows in the opposite direction as the oil. That's the counterflow. And inside the shell, there are baffles that direct the water to flow across the tube, back and forth across the tube until it exits the shell. So this is what um, this is a drawing of, uh, of the real heat exchanger. Let's look at a schematic version of this. Essentially, we have two passages. We have oil coming in at state one and flowing through the heat exchanger, exiting at state two. Water flows in, going the opposite direction at state three, exits at state four. And we're going to take this system as both fluids. So all the oil molecules and all the water molecules are our system. And we note that heat will transfer from the oil, which is at a higher temperature than the water, and it will flow from the oil to the water. But there is no hand tr heat transfer with the surroundings. So this, the, this heat transfer flowing between the two fluids will not be captured in our energy balance because our energy balance for the entire system has no tra heat transfer to the surroundings. So what do we know about these flows? Well, we have an inlet for oil, uh, an exit for oil, and an inlet for water, and an exit for water. Let's look at the oil. State one is where the oil comes in. We don't know its pressure, but we know the pressure doesn't change as it flows through the heat exchanger. The temperature of the oil at the inlet is 450 K, which is 177 degrees C. The mass flow rate of oil is given as 10 kilograms per second. The specific heat of the oil is uh, said to be constant at two kilojoules per kilogram K. Now coming out of the heat exchanger, the oil is cooler. It's only at 350 K, but the pressure is unchanged. Let's look at the water side of the heat exchanger. The water comes in at a pressure of five bar and at a temperature of 20 degrees C. And this defines subcooled water. Now, we're told that there's no pressure change uh, between the inlet and the outlet for the water. So the water coming out is still at five bar. Now, we are asked to find the flow rate at which there will be no vapor in the water. Notice we're heating the water. And if we heat it too much, obviously, we can uh, start boiling it. And that's when we'll start getting vapor in the water. So what we're going to do is heat it up until it becomes to a saturated liquid. And at that point, there's no vapor. And that's going to define the minimum possible flow rate that we can allow. So let's look at the, the engineering model. Once again, I'll say that we're modeling the entire heat exchanger as the system, which is to say the flow of both fluids. We're going to treat it as an open system operating at steady state conditions. We're ignoring, ignoring uh, changes in kinetic and potential energy as being zero. We say that there's no um, heat transfer between the heat exchanger and the surroundings. And a heat exchanger can do no work because it has no mechanism for doing work. 
And we also said that there was no pressure change in either fluid as it flowed through the heat exchanger. And what we're really being asked to do is to find the minimum water flow rate, and that'll be M.3 of the water, so that the water at state four remains a liquid. So that is when it's exiting, it's a saturated liquid and it's not a mixture. Let's draw this uh, on a TV diagram. Let's show the two water states. Uh, we know that the water is uh, coming in at state three is at five bar and 20 degrees C. So I've shown that. So this is the inlet state of the water. Now the saturation temperature at five bar can be found in the water saturation table. And I found it as 151.9 degrees C. So that's the saturation temperature of water at five bar. 20 degrees C is well below that, thus it's subcooled. And as, it, um, as we uh, drop the flow rate of the water, it's going to go to a higher and higher temperature at the exit until finally it reaches the state where it's a saturated liquid. Now, were we to drop the flow rate any more, it would attempt to get even hotter, but at this point it's going to begin boiling and we'll have a, a vapor in the liquid at that point, which is not allowed. So state four here, uh, shown as the saturated liquid, is going to be the state that defines the minimum allowed flow rate for this problem. Let's write an energy balance. Well, recall that the delta Ke is zero, delta P e is zero, Q dot is zero, W dot is zero. And so we're left with just the mass flow rates times change in enthalpies. Now there are two mass flow rates in this energy balance. So we can write DDT is zero because it's operating at steady state. It's the mass flow rate at the uh, inlet of the oil times the change in enthalpy for the oil plus the mass flow rate for the water times the change in enthalpy for the water. So let's rewrite this energy balance as a mass flow rate ratio. We can say that mass flow rate uh, state three, which is the water, divided by the mass flow rate at state one, which is the oil, is just H1 minus H2 over H4 minus H3. All we did was rearrange the energy balance. Now let's find uh, a change in enthalpy for the oil. So we can say delta H for the oil, or in this case specifically, that's H1 minus H2. We know that for a, um, a subcooled liquid, which is what the oil is, it's just uh, C times delta T plus V times delta P. But there was no change in pressure for the oil. So that term is eliminated. And we're left with just simply that H1 minus H2 is the specific heat of the oil times T1 minus T2. We were given this specific heat. We know the inlet temperature is 450K. We know it's discharged at 350K. So we know for the oil, H1 minus H2 is 200 kilojoules per kilogram. Now we want to do the same for the subcooled water. We'll go to the uh, saturation water table and we'll at the inlet of 20 degrees C, um, we'll find the um, enthalpy for subcooled water. And by the incompressible uh, liquid model, we know that the enthalpy of a subcooled liquid is just the enthalpy of a saturated liquid at the same temperature, in this case, 20 degrees C. So from the saturation table at 20 degrees, I get an H3 is 83.96 kilojoules per kilogram. Now, for the exiting water, we've said that this exiting water will be, will evaluate as saturated liquid at a five bar. So H4 is H sub F at these conditions, which is 640.23 kilojoules per kilogram. So now we can go ahead and solve for the mass flow rate of the water under these conditions. It's the mass flow rate of the oil times the change in enthalpy for the oil, divided by the change in enthalpy for the water. And we have all of these values. And we calculate that uh, the mass flow rate is state three, well, that's the incoming water, is 3.6 kilograms per second. And we were asked for the range of flows that were allowable. So this is the minimum water flow rate that will keep vapor from forming in the water. We can have a higher flow rate 
but we cannot have a lower flow rate.